Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Midterm elections are just months away and no matter what you hear, the truth is Democrats do have a strong chance of taking over the House of Representatives if history is... Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Midterm elections are just months away and no matter what you hear, the truth is Democrats do have a strong chance of taking over the House of Representatives if history is any guide. What does that mean? Well, in the short term, it means that Nancy Pelosi will get unfettered subpoena power. Maxine Waters is likely to be chairman of the Financial Services Committee. It will be a big deal. But more broadly, it means an ascendant Democratic Party, and not the party you grew up with, but a new and far more radical and far more intolerant version of that party. How radical? Well, last night we showed you the violence. Tonight we have exclusive new material, the product of our reporting, just two weeks ago, progressive activists held a convention in New Orleans called Net Roots Nation. It happens every year. Virtually every major Democrat running for president went. By the fast-evolving standards of the left, Net Roots Nation is a mainstream gathering. It's not a fringe event. Well, this show sent an investigative team to Net Roots Nation to find out what the Democratic Party is becoming. The very first thing we noticed is that socialism, long discredited by nearly a century of murder and suffering, is re-emerging and moving toward the center of democratic politics. What I see is not a time for moderation. It's a time for progressives to double down on what we believe in. The establishment is terrified of that word, socialism. But if we learned one thing from the Obama years, it's that Republicans are going to call us socialists no matter what we do. So we might as well give them the real thing. Might as well give them real socialism. The crowd cheers. Just 10 years ago, Democrats nodded to the idea of border security. They said they were for it. Now, the very idea of immigration enforcement of any kind, of borders themselves, is considered repugnant on the left. I happen to believe that an agency that has repeatedly, systematically, and, violent, and violently committed human rights abuses cannot be reformed. Just imagine, no wall, no wall in southern Arizona. Disagree with that? Think open borders are a bad idea? You're not simply wrong in the eyes of the new left, you're immoral. The Republicans will continue to practice the politics of division. They will keep right on attacking anyone who dares to stand up to the rich and the powerful. Do you need to wait for Robert Mueller to tell you Trump is wildly corrupt? We must defeat a Republican Party which has sold its soul to a Republican, a Republican president without one. The president has no soul. Republicans are in the pocket of the rich, says the hedge fund private equity party. The president, of course, denounced as a racist, while actual race baiters like Maxine Waters, who once encouraged a race riot, were lauded as heroes. We're not going to let you come to Ohio, President Trump, and do your race baiting and make your racial statements, whether it's LeBron James or Maxine Waters or anybody else. That ain't playing anymore, President Trump. Well, ironically, for a gathering they said was designed to empower the marginalized, voters of color, as they say, attendees at this event tended to skew much older, paler, and more affluent. Well, a group of progressive activists noticed this, and a group of them stormed the stage during Saturday's keynote speeches. They demanded more black representation, and they promised to drink the crowd's, quote, white tears. That white fragility is showing. Those white tears are showing, but guess what? I'm ready to drink them because we are going to be on the board. You're going to let us on the board and you're going to fight for us to be on the board of Netroots. Ready to drink white tears. Well, in an effort to atone for their skin color, organizers did what they could to attack white America. Among the books distributed at the event was one called Brown is the New White, How Demographic Revolution Has Created a New American Majority. One poster we found said that one of the, quote, challenges for American democracy is that white voters are able to vote and elect officials. In any other venue, that would, of course, be described as racism, but it was normal at net roots. And then there were the bizarre portions of the program, and there were a lot of those. One well-attended panel dealt with the matter of, quote, menstrual equity. 
This is the latest frontier in the civil rights movement, in case you've been on vacation. One elected Democrat from Virginia we spoke to said male access to tampons is a vital and important emerging issue. We're not sure how many men who are are menstruating based on uh, transgender uh, surgeries or other ways that they're transforming. We're not sure how many men are menstruating. Happily, the Democratic Party is trying to find out even as you sleep. It went on like this. This is what the Democratic Party is running on in 2018. The end of free enterprise, vicious attacks on a huge portion of the American population solely because of their skin color, tampons in men's bathrooms. This is a movement that seeks to end borders and create a world where there are only two kinds of people. The 320 million American citizens who live here, you and me, and the 7 billion U.S. citizens who haven't gotten around to moving here yet, but have every right to move here when they feel like it. That would be the rest of the world. That's what utopia looks like if you're a member of the New York Times editorial board. But what if you're not? What if you're just an ordinary voter? Is any of this appealing? We'll find out in November. But we can speculate ahead of time with Richard Goodstein. He's an attorney. He advised both of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns, and he joins us tonight. Richard, thanks a lot for coming on. Of course. Now, um, socialism. Two years ago, it was, I think, pretty conclusively believed by most people that socialism had been tried over a period of almost 100 years, resulted in tens of millions of deaths and grotesque human suffering, and that maybe it was something that we didn't want to try again. Now, mainstream Democratic candidates are saying we need socialism. Is this a direction that you applaud? So, uh, Cynthia Nixon uh, was the only person that you just depicted who embraced socialism, and I wouldn't call her a no. mainstream Democratic candidate. And the candidates, frankly, who have well, Alexandria Bernie Ocasio-Cortez is not a mainstream candidate. Uh, 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 She's uh, about look, to be a member of she Congress. She got less. She got fewer than sixteen thousand votes, Tucker. You know that. That's true. She doesn't speak for anybody but those sixteen thousand people. You you know this as well. The Bernie Sanders okay. back candidates, one second, let me finish this one sentence. The okay. Bernie oh, Sanders back candidates in open primaries are getting clobbered by mainstream Democratic candidates. Candidates okay, supported so, by so the I Democratic guess that's my Party. question. Hold on, wait, hold on, hold on. But before you get polemical on me, uh, this is a sincere question. You don't believe that Democrats running as socialist, Democratic socialists, some species of socialist, that's not the future of your party. You're not going to see more of that? Are you, are you sincerely saying that? Uh, it, what I'm sincerely saying is... Because it seems like we are seeing more of that. So if you look at the polling, polling that supports moderate answers, uh, a regional minimum wage, not a $15 minimum wage, for example, that supersedes anything, that beats anything that Trump is standing for or that Bernie Sanders okay. is, so, is standing for. So oh, there's so, a so moderate then, so support here's my question. Yeah. Uh, the, look, I'm for moderate Democrats. So if your argument is we need more moderate Democrats, I'm on your side. I agree Good. with that completely. This is scary because these are not moderate people. They're intolerant extremists. And they seem to be moving toward the center of your party. That's the only point I'm making. And yeah. so you disagree. Then my question is, where are the leaders of your party saying, you know what, we're not a socialist party, actually. That's been tried. It's happening right now in Venezuela. It's not working. We don't stand for that. I don't hear anybody saying that. Why doesn't Nancy Pelosi say that? Well, you know, it's so really funny. You saw this polling about where Democrats are vis-a-vis -vis capitalism, right? What's funny is trade wars are not capitalist. Picking winners and losers is not capitalist. Those are probably two of the hallmarks of the Trump economy um, that we've seen so far. So it's a very well, odd thing on. to sort I mean, of wait, hold on. Wait, wait, but before you lecture me on the definition of capitalism, I'm not, I don't know if you're quite qualified for that, let me just restate my question. If socialism is antithetical to what it is to be a Democrat, why don't Democratic leaders say that out loud? I don't think Democrats need to respond to the Cynthia Nixons of the world with all due respect to her. What Democrats okay. are standing okay. for... Then we'll see. I hope you're right. I hope you're I think I hope you're right. We, we, we'll see in the elections. Okay, let me ask you this then. Why wouldn't it be very easy for Democratic leaders to say, it's really simple, you can't attack people on the basis of their skin color. You know, we fought a civil rights movement over this, and Democrats were the forefront of the civil rights movement. They were also the forefront of the segregation, but they were, honestly, leading the charge against racial discrimination for like 50 years. And right. now they're saying it's okay to attack people on the basis of their skin color. Why doesn't someone stand up and say, no, that, that's just wrong. All lives matter. Why is if that so hard? If if there's one prominent person in public life today who's attacking people on the basis of their skin color, he resides in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Ask his okay, top okay. black official. Okay, Ask but, the public. Okay. Frankly, it's, in it's all really, the polls... Okay. So, so we, we, 
I get it. We've established you think Trump is bad, but this well, isn't really a question I, I about the your public party. does. Talk no, I, I get Trump is okay. The, uh, Trump, 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 Trump. Well, no, we try to be the one show that doesn't talk about Trump for the entire hour. So let me just restate the question. I'm with you. Why is it so hard? for Democratic leaders to stand up for an established principle of the Democratic Party, one that I grew up with, that we shouldn't attack people on the basis of their skin color. I'm hearing Democrats at all levels, elected, unelected, pundits on television, New York Times editorial writers, attack fellow Americans for their skin color. That's immoral. Why does nobody say so? I, I, I don't think every Democratic leader has to respond to every kook. Right, and I don't think we're looking at elected officials really? who are attacking people on the Sarah basis Jones of their skin color. The, excuse me. Really? You, you <laughs> think the the New York Times editorial writer, uh, uh, who just the basis, who was at the center of this huge controversy, she attacked right. people for their skin color. She was roundly defended by left wing pundits on the other channels. Why didn't anybody say, you know what, you're not allowed to see? It's like it's not a good thing to attack people on the basis of immutable characteristics they can't control. Nobody said that. And anyone well, who tried I, to say that was denounced. If, What's if she going gets on? Well, you know, if she gets elected as a Democrat to Congress, then I think we'll actually have reason to debate this. But so long as all she is, no disrespect, is a member of the editorial board of the New York Times, honestly, the editorial board of the New York Times has people on it that have a lot of different positions on race issues, among others. So I, I guess I quarrel with whether that gets ascribed to the Democratic Party. I just don't think it does. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I see it everywhere. Maybe I'm paranoid or something, but I mean, every single day, I, I every news site I go to is making the same point. Next some time races you sit are down superior to others, Trump, and please. I didn't grow up in a world where that was okay. And all I'm saying is, next time you sit down with Donald Trump, please tell him exactly what you just said to me, how that's wrong. But Trump's never said anything, people. he's never said anything like that, actually. I mean, if we're being totally real, I know Trump is evil and everything, but if Trump ever got up there and said, one race is better than others, this race should be a shame for who it is, I'd be the first one to say, what? You can't say that. That's wrong. If you had true. any other president calling a black person a dog, or consistently saying that black people were oh, low whatever. IQ, who I he disagreed know. with, yes, I think that's exactly the term you would ascribe to them. Sorry. You know, it says it to everybody. And by the way, what bothers me, to be totally honest, is I love dogs. I don't think being compared to a dog is an insult. I mean, I'm dead serious. Uh, I, I want to stand up for dogs on the show. Anyway, Richard, thank you. Good to see you. My pleasure. Well, Senator Elizabeth Warren also spoke at Netroots, and during her remarks, she denounced the nation's criminal justice system, all of it, and everyone who works for it, as racist. Here it is. Let's just start with the hard truth about our criminal justice system. It's racist. I mean, front to back. This is not just sentencing reform we're talking about here. We're talking about the front end on what you declare to be illegal, on how you enforce it, on who gets arrested. Well, those remarks sparked a backlash, obviously, from law enforcement. Warren is now trying to clarify her remarks. She says she wasn't calling any individual law enforcement personnel racist, even as she condemned the entire institution they worked for. What exactly was she saying, and is it a good idea to say that on the eve of an election? Dana Prino is exactly the person to ask. She hosts the Daily Briefing with Dana Prino every day at 2 p.m. You watch it, obviously, on Hi, Fox. Tucker. And she joins us. Hey, Dana. So, I mean... Look, I don't want to pile on, but I want to ask a sincere question, which is, why would, you know, she's an ideologue, Elizabeth Warren, but she's also a political person who got elected statewide in Massachusetts. She's not stupid. She doesn't say things in public accidentally. What is the thinking here? Is that a good political move to attack the whole justice system as racist? Well, it depends on what race you're running for. Okay, so she um, is good likely point. to be a 2020 candidate for the Democratic Party. So if you go to uh, Netroots Nation and you say that as a Democratic candidate, you are going to get praise. But here's the problem. She's also running for re-election right now as a senator in her home state of Massachusetts. The reason she had to backtrack is because police in her own state, sheriffs who typically stay out of politics for the most part, had written an open letter condemning the comments. So she had to you know, pull back. So she is in a paradox of what race are you running for? The other thing, Tucker, I would say is that you know, sometimes in politics it's all about timing. In many ways, she should have run in 2016. She would have had the entire left field yes. to herself. She didn't do that, and now that field is so crowded. That's exact. That is a very. I agree with you completely. This is the Chris Christie problem. It was four yeah. years too late. Last, right. That was her cycle. So. What ha is anybody concerned about the effect of, I mean, it's one thing to say, look, there are things about our system that are 
bad and could be improved. Everyone agrees with that. But to attempt to delegitimize the entire justice system inevitably is going to increase the amount of crime and disorder in America. And that has well, always been a pretty powerful political issue. Are they worried about that? I'd say, a I'd say a couple of things. You know, there are three of her colleagues or potential um, you know, can candidates that she'll run against for the Democratic primary have been in the criminal justice system, have made their careers there. Eric Holder, the former hmm. attorney general for uh, President Obama. Right. Deval Patrick, the former governor of her home state of Massachusetts. Kamala Harris, the senator from California, was a prosecutor. Could it possibly be that all of them were participating in this racist system? That would be one question that I, if, if you were running against <laughs> her as question. one of those Democrats, like, yes. I would ask her that. But the other thing is that if you just take a bigger picture look at this, she has, as I, I wrote it down here, she has pretty much um, taken a whole wonderful opportunity away from herself and for the people she says she wants to help. I was just looking at it. was just last week. President Trump held that event at Bedminster on his uh, time off on criminal justice reform. He wants to actually get to a deal. He wants to do something about it. The question will actually be, will the Democrats let him help them? Will they give him a chance to sign legislation right. that would actually change the criminal justice system? There is bipartisan support here. Jared Kushner is pushing it. People like Van Jones, I know he's at CNN, but he also has outside work. He's been working on this. There is bipartisan support in the Senate. The president's willing to sign something. The question will be, do the Democrats want a solution or a problem that they can run against? That is such a good point. And if the White House is clever, they'll, I think they'll point that out. Dana Prino. Great analysis. Thank okay. you. Great Thank to you. see you, <laughs> as always. Well, from London to Sweden, Europe is in chaos, widespread violence overnight. There's a reason it's happening, government policy. Are the governments in Europe, is our government, by the way, willing to be honest about why this is happening? Nigel Farage joins us to discuss it next. Well, the heart of English civilization was hit by yet another terror attack today. A 29-year-old man rammed his vehicle into cyclists and pedestrians right in the center of London. People were injured, but thankfully nobody was killed. Meanwhile, in Sweden, at least 80 cars were torched in several cities in what the prime minister says were, quote, extremely organized attacks. No motives have been identified for either attack, officially anyway. Both England and Sweden are ancient civilizations, and for decades, violence like this was basically unheard of. Now, thanks to deliberate policy choices by those in power, that has changed radically. The question is, are we free to describe what is happening? Nigel Farage once led the UK Independence Party. He joins us tonight. Nigel, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you. So, um, it, it's not even worth, it seems to me, speculating about what happened here. We don't have all the facts. I don't want to get out on a limb. But I, here's what we do know, indisputably, that ancient societies in Europe, and indeed our society, far less ancient in the United States, are all becoming much more volatile and divided from within due to deliberate government policies over the course of decades. It seems like the people who made those policies are trying to prevent the rest of us from assessing those policies or complaining about them. Is that your read? Well, you know, Sweden, I think, has just about the most restrictive press in the whole of the Western world. Uh, it is very difficult to get any objectivity from Swedish press, uh, and certainly no criticism in mainstream Swedish media of government policy. Just to be clear, Sweden, a country of about 10 million people that has let in 600,000 asylum seekers in the course of the last five years. So pro rata, Sweden have let in more than any other country, and bear in mind that most of those that come, Tucker, are males under the age of 30 who come from a completely different culture, different attitudes towards women, uh, for example, and Sweden has changed more than any other European country. And what is going on now in those cities is a disaster. The mass arson that has taken place, as the Prime Minister said, on a coordinated basis. Huge levels in the rise in sexual crime, for example. All of it caused by government policy. And I tell you, on the 9th of September, there is a Swedish general election, um, and what the networks will run is shock surprise, as the far right does well in Sweden. Well, all of this 
has been caused by politicians. What I guess I'm confused by is the lack of curiosity on the part of the left in the United States, the party of science, that you'd think would be interested in an empirical inquiry into the results of Swedish and European immigration policy. We're following the same course. Why wouldn't we be interested in the outcomes? But we're not. In fact, we punish anyone who's interested in the outcomes. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, this is sort of part of the almost self-loathing uh, that much of uh, the West seems to have through its politicians, through its media. Um, you know, we are to uh, be kind and open-hearted and show the world what virtuous and wonderful people we are, even if we imperil our whole way of life. There can be no clearer, better example than Sweden what has happened there in the last five years with opening up the door to large numbers of young men with different religion, different language, different culture. It has been a disaster. And actually, I'll be honest with you, I fear for the future of those Swedish cities. Now, if uh, people want to keep their head in the sand over this, they can do so. But the evidence is that voters are acting on this. Brexit, the election of Trump, uh, the Italian elections, voters have simply had enough of this and they are rebelling. Yeah, that is, of course, the upside of democracy. You'd think American universities would have dispatched an army of social scientists to study this, since it's a handy case study for what awaits us, but they haven't. Nigel, great to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, for decades, it has been assumed, it's been axiomatic, that everybody born on American soil is automatically an American citizen. They tell us it's in the Constitution. Is it in the Constitution? Is it a good idea? Could it be changed? Could the White House change it overnight? If so, should they? All of that next. Well, supporters of mass immigration are always telling you that all immigration, no matter where it's from or who's coming, is good for America. They seldom give you numbers to back that up because there aren't any. Here's some other numbers. A new report by the Center for Immigration Studies found that more than half of all refugees in this country are currently on food stamps living off taxpayer largesse. They're not the only ones benefiting from the U.S. welfare state. Even illegal immigrants are receiving welfare on behalf of their children who are automatically treated as U.S. citizens. It has long been assumed that anyone born here is automatically a citizen and the Constitution requires that. But in fact, that might not be the case. In a recent Washington Post piece, former Trump administration official Michael Anton argued the president could issue tomorrow an executive order that the children of illegal immigrants are not to be treated as citizens. And why wouldn't he do that? Could the president do that? And if so, why isn't he? Victor Davis Hanson is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He joins us tonight. Victor Davis Hanson, thanks very much for coming on. Um, so it's a, it's a simple question. If it is true that the Constitution does not mandate citizenship for anyone born here regardless of status or the status of his parents then why are we acting like that's the law well i think it's because the fourteenth amendment following the civil war was aimed uh, to address the problems of post-civil war slavery nobody really who yes. drafted that law dreamed that we would have four million people born to foreign nationals most of whom were here illegally who would be granted citizenship so it's kind of murky and we have about 150 years of jurisprudence that can't quite adjudicate what they meant and that we have a court uh, difficulties and you know disagreements but I think what we could do Tucker is that we're the only real country that people want to go here with the exception of Canada that allows birth tourism or to people to become citizens whose parents are not only not citizens but may be here illegally. Europe doesn't do it. Liberal, the most liberal socialist countries in Europe, Asia, most of our, they do not do it. It's mostly a new world phenomenon and it's really only applies to the United States because that's where people want to come. So it's, it's, it's something that's archaic and uh, I think we could modify it. We could do it escalate. We could say, you know, in five years uh, we're going to we're going to gradually go into a law where one parent must be a citizen or if you have two resident aliens they must be here say for five years of residency or ten years of residency and they have to be legal but the idea you would give instant citizenship to somebody born of two parents that were here illegally it, it doesn't it's incoherent well it's it's of course rewarding their illegal stats, but it also suggests that the people awarding the citizenship don't value citizenship, that it's, it's meaningless to them. Do you want leaders who don't consider American citizenship a prize? 
Well, it's part of a it's part of a leveling process we've seen with progressivism that all hierarchy, all rules, all requirements are trying to be done away to achieve this utopian goal of you know and a quality of result and and it leads to tangential problems and people who are here illegally 55 percent of the households in california are on some sort of public assistance federal state or local and maybe half of the households nationwide and that's what you'd expect when about over half of our immigrants come uh... with a lot of disadvantages they come illegally they come without a high school diploma they come without English, they come to a society that no longer values a melting pot and assimilation and integration, but does really, as a humane society, we want to provide parity, and the only way we can do that is massive social welfare assistance and, you know, anchor babies and the whole idea of granting citizenship almost to, to anybody who comes who, ha who happens to have a child here. I mean, if we're rewarding foreign nationals who break our laws, why should I have to pay my taxes? Why should I, as an American citizen, obey the laws? I mean, I get maybe I guess that's a rhetorical question, but what's the message that we're sending? I have to obey every law or else I go to jail, but a foreign national can show up and give the finger to our justice system and get rewarded for it. How does that work exactly? I, I don't know, but I can tell you that if I have a false ID and I use a false ID or a double identity, that's a felony and my career's ruined. And yet the IRS said over the last four or five years, there was one million people here illegally who had a false ID and used that false ID. It's identity theft. And yet when we look at yeah. ways to calibrate felonies or misdemeanors, people say, well, if you come here illegally and you reside here illegally and you use a false ID, that's not really serious enough. Uh, grounds for deportation, but for you or me, we w you wouldn't be talking to me and I wouldn't be answering you tonight if we had false IDs. And yet over a million people yeah. have done it and people don't consider it a crime. Too bad Paul Manafort's an American citizen. Maybe he wouldn't be facing 305 years in prison for tax evasion. Uh, Professor, thank you. It's great to see you as always. Really smart. Thank you, Tucker. We don't do a ton of environmental stories on this show, but there actually is a real environmental disaster unfolding in slow motion in the state of Florida. A red tide, the biggest in over a decade, clearing out beaches, killing marine life on a vast scale, wrecking the state. Why is this happening? Why hasn't anything been done? You may not even have heard this story, but stick around because it's amazing. Stay tuned. A state of emergency has been finally declared in Florida. Not a hurricane, but a red tide, a shocking red tide, one of the largest the state has seen in over a decade. It is killing so many fish. It has shut down beaches on the West Coast, all over the state. Why is this happening? Jeff Flock of Fox Business is investigating for our show. Here's his report. Tucker, we come to you tonight uh, with the sound of a drone. Perhaps you see it here, and this kind of gives you the best picture of the green tide. Go ahead, guys, take it uh, away. Maybe he gets a better picture that way. This is the green tide, which has hit the inland areas. This is uh, largely as a result of the runoff uh, from Lake Okeechobee, agricultural runoff, the uh, fertilizer and other agricultural products running into the rivers and leading to this kind of pond scum, which some have called it. It's actually kind of a green kale smoothie. This is in addition to the red tide. Maybe you see some of the, of the fish and other marine life that have been killed by the red tide. That's a separate issue, but kind of a double whammy for uh, the folks in southwest Florida and south Florida uh, right now. And I, uh, I, it's become something of a political issue about what that runoff coming out of uh, Lake Okeechobee, because this is what's in the backyard of a lot of folks that live out here. That is, uh, well, that's an algae bloom. Uh, and a lot of people think it's as a result of too much water uh, coming out of Lake Okeechobee with too much agricultural runoff. Not a pretty picture in uh, southwest Florida tonight. Tucker. Thanks, Jeff. A bona fide disaster. Dr. Richard Pierce is a scientist at the Moat Marine, the famous Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota in Boca Grande, Florida. And he joins us tonight. Doctor, thank you very much uh, for coming on. Uh, the scale of this, for people who haven't seen it, it is, is enormous. Th this is horrifying. Why did it take until right now for a state of emergency to be declared? Well, I, I'm not sure, Tucker, what the criteria would be for uh, having a state of emergency. Uh, we've been studying this particular bloom on and off since last October. 
uh, and it just goes uh, north, south, offshore, onshore. In some areas it becomes quite intense and then uh, other areas it's not so bad. Uh, but it has been very intense along the mid uh, of the West Florida Shelf uh, coast and so uh, people have just uh, been exposed to it for too long and, and they're really uh, just uh, fed up with it. It's, dis it's destroying one of the greatest fisheries in the United States, a, really an in a, a natural resource of incalculable value. So wh is it as clear as agricultural interests are doing this? That is, seems to be the explanation. Is that true? Well, it depends on whether you're talking about the cyanobacteria, which is the freshwater harmful algal bloom, or if you're talking about the red tide, which is the saltwater harmful algal bloom. Uh, my area of research focuses primarily on the red tide, which is a naturally occurring part of the natural phytoplankton community, which are the microscopic single-celled uh, photosynthetic organisms, and, and this particular one is a dinoflagellate. It also produces some very potent neurotoxic chemicals, which affect right. animals much like some pesticides do. Uh, normally when there's just a few cells in the water, which there are normally, if you have a, just a few cells per liter or per quart, there's not enough toxin to cause a problem. When it gets to hundreds of thousands and millions, as it is in some areas along the coast of Florida right now, it becomes a serious problem. And, and that's what we're feeling right now. Uh, this is, as you've said, a very serious bloom, and it's been going on for some time. It, in my uh, tenure here at Moat Marine Laboratory, which has been a little over 30 years, uh, I would say we have had equally intense blooms and actual ones that lasted longer than this. So it's something that has happened before, but it is something that we need to get a better handle on. Uh, we've been studying what it is, where it is, understanding the public health aspects of yeah. it, and how to avoid them, how to mitigate those effects. Uh, now we're starting to look more at what, what might be done about uh, actually controlling it, especially what's along the coast. And anyone who's adding to this should be in trouble, it seems to. I mean, if you're looking, if you're out there and you consider yourself an environmentalist, you know, this would be one of those rare events that's worth being upset about, it seems to me. Dr. Pierce, thank you very much. Good to see you. Well, Antifa agitators attacked members of the press this past weekend, but that same press seems determined to defend them. That's masochism. What accounts for it? We'll tell you after the break. So in Washington and Charlottesville over the weekend, Antifa demonstrators turned out in force. They said they were there to fight fascism, but because they live in an entirely irony-free world, they themselves acted like fascists. They went after police officers and members of the press. Well, despite that, plenty of media personalities remained eager to defend them since they don't oppose political violence, only political violence by people they disagree with. You attack cops, you slap the media, you're in the wrong, period. But I argue to you tonight, all punches are not equal morally. They are also wrong to hit, but fighting hate is right. People who show up to fight against bigots are not to be judged the same as the bigots, even if they do resort to the same kinds of petty violence. Thuggishness is thuggishness wherever it comes from politically, and we should be the first to call it out. I disagree. Sometimes you can't fight people by, you know, praising them or being nice to them. You have to fight fire with fire sometimes. So political violence is acceptable as long as you agree with me. It's hard to believe we're hearing this out loud and on television, but we are. Tammy Bruce has been watching it carefully. She's a radio talk show host, president of the Independent Women's Voice, and she joins us tonight. Tammy, what you just heard is an out-in-the-open, bald justification for political violence. Uh, it is, and of course, it's not. We're not unfamiliar with this. We've seen this historically. Uh, Americans have looked back traditionally on history and wondering how did that happen in Germany? How how do how do these things happen in left-wing cultures where people do inexplicable things? And here it is unfolding in front of us. This this remarkably obscene su su suggestion that certain violence is okay against your fellow Americans. We have a system here that is unique in that people who we disagree with, we can argue against them, 
we have these ideas in the open and we, we can even marginalize them by and make it public that we don't like them. Uh, we, we have legislation and we have a government that protects us with the rule of law. That's what makes America unique and different. What they're suggesting is all of that should go out the window. And that's the problem here. And what's, but here's why they're doing it. Uh, they've also invested in a narrative that says that President Trump uh, has, is the creation of a new racism, that America is a racist country, and, and, that, uh, it, and the only way to prove that, of course, uh, is with events like this. And yet the problem for them is you had, what, about 25 white racists in Washington, D.C. Most Americans, Tucker, get more people at their backyard barbecue every weekend. And even after... Well, that's exactly... To, right, right. Then that's the real news here. And yet, because... But isn't that... But, but hold on. But isn't that... Let me just ask you, as someone who's lived in this country a long time, and you've been on both sides yeah. of the political divide... Sure have. ...over your life, there aren't a lot of white supremacists. At least, no, I'm almost 50. I, I've never met a single one of them. Yeah. I mean, where are all these... I'm serious. Do yeah. you run into a lot of white supremacists in the no. course of your life? Any? Yeah. Yeah, no, look, this nation has made it, has, has done a very good job at, at becoming, we've all become better people as time goes on. That's what Americans do. Uh, and that's the real story, Tucker, is that they don't exist. Yeah, I agree. And, and yet, the media and uh, many on the left want it to seem such, like such an existential threat that you've got to exact violence against them because it's right there at your exactly. doorstep. And this is where the problem is. Now, this Antifa group, uh, the Barack Obama administration, declared early in 2016 that they were using domestic violence, uh, domestic terrorism violence, and they warned all states and local authorities that this would be an increasing problem uh, as an organized anarchist effort. Uh, it, too, is limited. There's maybe 200 of them showed up in Washington. But the fact is the media is abandoning its job by not only not presenting the real facts of what's occurred here, which is what we've just discussed, but casting it as something large, uh, existentially threatening, and something that should legitimize violence against individual exactly. Americans. That is what Americans are rejecting, and uh, it's a shame to see it so out in the open uh, with That's exactly uh, right. fellow journalists. Nicely put. Tammy, great to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker. Well, elections tonight, primaries in four different states, including the critical state of Wisconsin. Fox chief political anchor Brett Baer is here with the very latest and the very latest on an unfolding story around Keith Ellison. Brett joins us after the break.